I'd like to share with you some thoughts that were provoked by uh, a phrase that struck me out of uh, the first chapter of Romans. Uh, it's, a, it's a very familiar passage. Um, Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Uh, and the phrase that, that uh, struck me, perhaps I don't know why, but it was that short phrase, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I don't know how often uh, you've heard uh, on these sort of inclusive statements, uh, the claim that this is this is for those of all faiths and none. Uh, it's a foolish statement because there is not one man alive who doesn't have faith. The issue is whether it's a, a faith which is grounded and solid, or whether it's a faith that's grounded in something which is is totally uh, off the wall, or unsustainable. Um, of course, the the, uh, the quotation that, that we're given was is a quotation from Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter two. Uh, the quotation that Paul makes about the righteous living by faith uh, uh, reads as follows, because it also gives us something of a hint of the background behind what what the issue is. The quote goes like this, behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Habakkuk starts, doesn't he, with the condition of the lost. His soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. New life comes with true faith. Now, I found some of the old commentators really quite helpful in understanding uh, or, or in, in, in illuminating things to do with uh, uh, the, the scriptures. And uh, I, I like what William uh, William Burkett says about the uh, about this uh, this opening verse in Romans. Um, the opening verse is, of course. If I can find it again, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Burkitt writes this. Observe here, first, the glorious description which the, the apostle gives of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. That is, the preaching of it is attended by and accompanied with an almighty power, which renders it effectual to salvation, if we do not bolt our ears and hearts against it. Learn that the plain and persuasive preaching of the gospel is the chosen instrument in God's hand, which he uses and honours for the conveyance of spiritual life into the souls of men though it be despised and ridiculed by men of the world. The gospel is powerful. It is the power 
not of men or angels, but the power of God. Not the essential power, but instrumental power of God. It works as an instrument, yet not as a natural instrument, but as a moral instrument in God's hand. Freely, not arbitrarily. The word gives out to us as God gives in to it. The power of the gospel is not from the preachers of the gospel, but they are instruments in God's hand. Their words are the vehicle or organ through which the vital power of the spirit is conveyed. Observe too, the solemn presentation and bold profession which the apostle makes of his not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Where, note first, he doesn't say, I'm not afraid to preach the gospel, but I am not ashamed, because shame hinders our readiness more than fear. A man may be fit and ready to preach the gospel and may yet be afraid to undertake it. But he that is ashamed of the work can never be fit for it. Note too, that when the apostle says he is not ashamed of the gospel, more is intended than expressed. And so far from being ashamed, that I account my, count it my glory, as if the apostle had said, truly I esteem it the highest honour that God can confer on me to preach the gospel at Rome, though it should cost me my life. Oh, how exceeding well doth the bold profession of the gospel become all the members of Jesus Christ. Let all say with the apostle, we are not ashamed of the gospel. You see, Burkitt's point is that the main focus of the gospel is not intellectual. It's not emotional. It's moral. The gospel challenges where people stand before the living God. Now we know that uh, today we're living in an age where so much foolishness is expressed, don't we? Uh, that phrase I've quoted, the, the phrase, uh, to those of all faiths and none. Um, and you, you may know that great comment by G.K. Chesterton, when, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. Uh, a quotation which expresses, doesn't it, the, the truth of what we evidently see in society today in the way men try to avoid reality and assert that, what, that they are what they're not and require others to accept their claims. We're living in a day when we have living examples of George L. Orwell's new speak, don't we, where words are evacuated of the uh, usual meanings and invested with some other meanings. Diversity, inclusivity, equality. And all these, if you look at them carefully, are nothing more than a statement of man's rejection of God. Diversity, an expression of who are you to say or who is God to say that what I'm doing is wrong. Inclusivity, an expression of I insist that, that you accept that what I say is perfectly acceptable. And equality, an expression that indicates that uh, uh, we, you, you must not exclude us or think us wrong about anything that, that we hold tr to be true. Foolishness, diversity, inclusivity, equality, D-I-E. This is the consequence of D-I-E, die, the death of the conscience, so that the individual can believe anything to be true, even contrary to common sense and reality. Uh, and we may find it very difficult to confront such, such faith. In, in fact, I'm sure Paul, although he was not ashamed of the gospel, was often disappointed that when he preached the truth, there were those who rejected it. Paul suffered, didn't he, for preaching the gospel? This didn't make what he preached untrue. 
It didn't mean that it lacked power. But what it lacked at the time was that convicting power of the Holy Spirit to apply it to the hearers. Now, we are met here, aren't we, to, uh, to pray for revival. Let's remember that the gospel we have is the only weapon that we need. But the weapon itself has no power in our hands. It must be accompanied by that lively work of the Spirit of God. And that's why we pray, surely, that God would stretch out his hand, that he will accompany the preaching of the gospel. A gracious invitation. Why would men not refuse the gospel when God holds out a hand to them? I suppose, firstly, because they refuse to see, refuse to accept the immorality of their position. They refuse to accept the fact that they are in need. Need is the great driver, isn't it? That need is created by a working of the spirit. It's the same need that we have, isn't it? As we come, I, I, I was struck by uh, the similarity of the case of Hannah Elkanah's wife. In our situation today, we feel barren, don't we? So often in the preaching of the gospel, well, she was barren. We know about her prayer uh, and Eli's response to her and the change that came about in her because of the assurance she received. But I can't believe that Hannah, in all those years that she went up to the temple with her husband and with her rival, hadn't prayed that prayer time and time again. Our God requires that we are persistent with him, doesn't he? He asks us, Lord, to to, he asks us to, to, to come to him, to acknowledge our need. We can't use just intellectual persuasion. Yes, there is a place for it. I spend a lot of time arguing with atheists about the fact that science isn't on, on their side. It's on the side of, of uh, what we see and understand from Scripture in the created word. That was exactly what Paul said, wasn't it, in that opening section? that they are without excuse, because the things displaying the glory of God are evident in his creation. And yet, these words will only come into the souls of men when they feel and understand that they are moral creatures with a moral debt that they can't pay. That's only something which the Lord himself can create in them. We can argue the case, but we need his help. We need him to take that instrument that Burkitt calls it and apply it. It is a powerful instrument. There's a passage in uh, 1 Corinthians in, well, in which, in which uh, Paul uh, again repeats much the, same, much the same argument. Let me find it. One Corinthians one verse seventeen. But Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks, foolishness but to those who are called both jews and greeks christ the power of god and the wisdom of god temptation is often isn't it to get involved in an intellectual debate and i wonder how many of our uh, even our fellow christians are led astray in this we argue about uh, the theology <laughs> uh, we have 
the Pentecostal view, which looks for signs. We have the uh, the theologian who looks uh, for wisdom. But unless Christ is in it all, uh, there's no power to it. It's Christ we preach, not wisdom, not miracles, not wonders, but God, a God of mercy and grace, the God who holds out his hand to us and awakens us to our moral condition, to our moral failure, to our moral need and to the provision he's made for it. And that's a need that continues, doesn't it? Not just before we come to Christ, but afterwards. Uh, I'm currently attending an Anglican church and uh, uh, I'm struck every time we go through the, the order of service, the words of the prayer that I'll close with, because it's a prayer that we need to continually pray. It's a prayer that was prayed, uh, penned by someone many, many years ago. It's very short. So let's come conclude uh, my session here by, by praying this prayer together. Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse, we pray thee, the thoughts of our hearts, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name. Amen.